You know, at our goal as a church, uh, we try to put it in places that you can see, um, are to know Jesus and to make him known. <laughs> Uh, we like to have that logo or that slogan everywhere because we want everything that we do to reflect Jesus, or we want everything that we do to help us to, to know who Jesus is, but more than just as a historical figure or as a, a good teacher with a high moral code, um, it's our prayer that we would know him in a personal and in a, a life-changing way, and that that relationship would develop and it would then, in effect, cause us to tell others about Jesus, to make him known to the world. And as you're aware, our world desperately needs Jesus. We want to know Jesus, and we want to make him known. So we're going to get into a text in the Bible. And if you guys didn't bring a Bible today, I have Craig over here, and I have Avinash. They all have Bibles. Um, if you don't have the Bible on your phone, or if you really want to follow along for yourself, just pop up your hand. They have a Bible that they'd love to put in your hands. And if you don't have a Bible, that is yours to keep. So we're going to be looking at um, one character in particular, and his picture is behind me. I don't know if you can identify who that is, but that is John the Baptist. Now, I want to talk about John the Baptist today, and I particularly wanted to share our slogan <laughs> or our mission because I believe that he had a very similar mission statement in his life. And he was a remarkable man. And he was known for a lot of different things. Um, he was known for his fashion. Uh, the Bible says that he wore clothes made of camel hair. Uh, he's known for his diet. He supposedly ate locusts and honey. And his mission was to baptize people, calling them to repentance and readying them for the Messiah. Now, I'd like to get into a little bit of depth into his life today. Um, we're going to kind of take a broad look at who he is as a person, what he accomplished here in the earth, and then we're going to zoom in on a couple parts, um, and especially a rather inglorious moment for him that not too many of us remember. Um, if you're not too familiar with his birth, um, it was miraculous, and it had a lot of different parallels with Jesus' birth as well. We can find the story, just like Jesus's, the foretelling of Jesus' birth in Luke 1. And I'm going to kind of summarize a lot of this background because it's a lot of text. But if you want later, you can follow along in, in Luke, um, Luke 1. But I'll, I'll try to give you some of the background information that we're going to get into a certain text later. So John's parents, they were named Elizabeth and Zechariah. They're both from families of priests. They were dedicated to following God's law and keeping all the Jewish customs. They were a great couple, but they were childless, and they were very old. And one day, Zechariah, he was actively serving as a priest, and he was going into the temple. He had to go burn incense um, in the temple. He was completing his priestly duties that he had to do. And while he was in there, he had an encounter with the angel Gabriel, and he was shook. Literally, Luke describes him as shaken and overwhelmed with fear. But Gabriel tells him to not be afraid, that God had heard his prayers for a son. And his wife was to become pregnant, and they were to name him John, and John was going to be great in the eyes of the Lord. He was to be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born, and he would be strong in spirit, and he would prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Now, Zechariah, as I mentioned, he was old. His wife was old. And he asked, how? How is this even possible? I'm an old man. My wife is old. And he didn't believe it, even though this terrifying angel was standing right in front of him. And due to his doubt and his unbelief, he was actually mute until John was born. Now, that's, that's quite interesting. I want you to remember that. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> So anyway, Zechariah had been inside the sanctuary for quite some time. People began to wonder what was going on in there. And when he came out and found that he was unable to speak, he sort of did some charades or gestures. And the people understood that he must have seen a vision, an incredible vision inside the sanctuary. And sure enough, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. She was so happy you can imagine. And when she was six months pregnant, she was visited by her relative, Mary. That's the same Mary, that's Jesus' mom. 
And Mary had just received news that she would carry the Messiah. And the sound of Mary's greeting, at the sound of Mary coming into the door, baby John jumped inside of his mother's belly. That's just amazing. And we know that, that God is, is in control, that God has done what he promised to do, and God had a plan even for that baby inside the belly. So John was born. And look what Luke records in chapter 1. I'm going to read in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 65. It should come up on the screen behind me, or if not, you can follow along in your Bibles. It says this, that awe fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, what will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. And it was right there that Zechariah regained his voice. And when they took John to the temple, the first thing he did was to prophesy that the Savior, the Messiah, the one that they had been waiting for, was being sent. He was only about two and a half months away as a baby. <laughs> and then he said this about his own son, and I just wanted to highlight it in, in verses 76 through 79. And you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Now, little did Zechariah know how, how powerful that prayer that prophecy would be for his son. Luke goes on to tell us in, in verse 80 that John grew up and he was strong in spirit. He lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Wow, I, I, just, I love the story of John because before John was even born into this world, he had a purpose. Even before he was born, he was pointing others to Jesus pointing others to the Messiah. This child was to grow up to do amazing things. Now, we don't know too much about his childhood or adolescence, but about 30 years go by. That's 30 years of, said, growing up in the wilderness. That's a lot of time eating locusts and living a very rugged life in the wilderness. But there, in the wilderness, John gets a message from God. And it's a message that, that caused him to go from place to place, telling everyone that they should be baptized to show that they have repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. It was time for people to know Jesus. It was time to make him known. Now was the time to call the people to get ready for the Messiah. So he spoke boldly. He went around and he wasn't afraid of anybody. He spoke boldly about repentance and when people would come to him with questions his answers showed that he was unafraid of the Pharisees or the soldiers or the tax collectors, and he even spoke out against the king, Herod Antipas. And he went on baptizing people, telling them, get ready, get ready, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, and the Messiah came. <laughs> Look what it says in John 1. In John 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming. He was coming toward him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, he is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and the rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The one you see the Spirit descend on and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Now, it's talking about the time that Jesus approached John the Baptist. 
and told John that he would be the one to baptize him. (laughs) He is the chosen one of God. What a declaration. What an incredible testimony. Just to be able to share in Jesus' baptism, to see the Spirit enter Jesus like that and the affirmation from God the Father, I'm sure that was an unforgettable moment. Have you ever had one of those moments? Now, maybe you haven't seen the Spirit descend like a dove, but have you ever had one of those moments that it, it changed the way your faith was? It changed the way that you, you approached God. It changed the trajectory of your life and faith. Is there anybody else that really embodies the mission statement to know Jesus and to make him known more than John the Baptist? Well, John had every reason to be confident in knowing Jesus as the Messiah because John was a relative of Jesus, remember? The Holy Spirit was with John from an early age and he revealed that Jesus was indeed the chosen one of God at the baptism. And John the Baptist lived through extraordinary experiences and it, he really was an example of what our faith should look like. So what I'm getting to And what I'm going to read might actually come as a surprise. But I'd like to spend the remainder of our time unpacking a question by John and exactly how Jesus responds to that question. Now, just about a year or two goes by after John had made that statement that he is the chosen one of God. (laughs) And John was now in prison. Now, John was sent to prison After publicly criticizing the king's marriage, the king had married his own brother's ex-wife. And the new queen, she despised John and she wanted him dead. And although the king didn't like John either, he was afraid of causing an uproar. So instead of killing him, he just tried to get rid of him by throwing him in jail. And this is where we find a very different John from the fearless camel-clad prophet. This is where we find a man who has been wrestling with doubt. So we're going to pick up the story in Luke 7. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 7, verse 18. And remember, I I wanted to tell you the whole background of John because this is the man who is now about to ask this question. Luke 7, verse 18. Now the disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything that Jesus was doing. So John called for two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord to ask him, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Are you the Messiah we've been waiting for, (laughs) or should we keep waiting for someone else? Wait a minute. (laughs) What is this, John? Really? (laughs) Is this doubt? Why would you be the one doubting? I mean, didn't you see the Spirit descend like a dove? Didn't you hear the voice from heaven saying, this is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy? Didn't you spend your life dedicating to knowing Jesus and making him known, preparing the way for those to ready themselves for the coming of the Savior? How is our fearless prophet now a doubting prisoner? It's crazy to think about. Well, there's a, there's a quote, a philosopher once said that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Now, some of you might recognize that quote. It was by Mike Tyson, and granted, he's probably not a philosopher, but he is a renowned boxer who, you know, had a lot of success in his career. But he said that because the, a reporter was asking him one day, what do you think about this fight that's coming up? I mean, this other boxer has said that he's been planning and he's been working and he has a routine every day and he knows how to take you apart. Well, his words do show a little bit of insight into what happens so often when we find ourselves in a wounded position. Many times we are shaken when we are metaphorically punched in the face. It's something that can take you by surprise, or perhaps you're even expecting it, but maybe you weren't ready for the emotional turmoil that subsequently followed the punch in the mouth. (laughs) It could be rage, it could be fear, it could be doubt. 
And John the Baptist, he had never feared the face of any man. Even the king could not intimidate him into staying silent. So John in the desert never had a reason to doubt Jesus. However, John in the dungeon had allowed that doubt to creep in. John's comfort zone was in the desert. <laughs> but being shut in a prison brought questions of doubt into his mind. Is he really the Messiah we've been waiting for? Or should we look for someone else? You know, it's not an unusual response if we're honest. <laughs> We think that we know how we will respond to times of trouble and praise the Lord for the times when our faith is strong and we're able to squash those little doubts that try to creep in. But in John's life here, and if we're honest, perhaps in our own, there can be times when the fears and the doubts can overpower our courage and our faith. Do you remember those words spoken by John's father when John was just eight days old? Well, if you don't, let me read it again. <laughs> this is back in Luke 1, verse 77. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. John was the one now sitting in darkness. John was sitting in the very shadows of death and his life would be taken from him shortly. See, doubt reigns when hope fades. And if we take our eyes off of Christ and his promise and we focus on the circumstances of our discomfort, you know, perhaps, perhaps we just feel like, you know what, he isn't responding the way I hoped. Have you ever been in a place where you've hoped for something? And you were hoping and hoping, and it just seemed like God was taking too long. Perhaps an answer to a prayer that just didn't seem like it was going to happen anymore, and you give up on it. Sometimes, or I should rephrase that, most of the time, God does not operate on our time frame. And certainly, a lot of times, our plans do not match up with His plans. Those that have sat in darkness and shadow of death need to be guided to the path of peace. And there is only one path. There's only one way. Now stay with me here because this, this is where we find the lesson that all of us need to learn. Because John, although he had doubts, he was not silenced by his doubts. There's a difference we see from him and his father. <laughs> and though his faith staggered, it looked to steady itself on that which John must have seen as the only firm foundation, the only one that could really give him answers, the answers that he really needed to hear. He went to Jesus with his doubts. Now let's retake the story in Luke 7, verse 20. John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for someone else? Now, at that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to many who were blind. So then he told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Now, I love this. Look at this. Was Jesus upset by this question by John's disciples? Does he berate John and reveal just how little faith he must have or how disappointed he was that John had forgotten about the incredible moments that they had shared? No, he doesn't do that. He encourages John by telling him what is happening. And I love the way that he answers you know, when people came to Jesus with questions, he usually gave them a lot more than what they were asking for. And a simple response could have simply been, why, yes, I am the Messiah you've been expecting. But Jesus is so wise. Because a lot of times, look at this, a lot of times we expect Jesus to be someone that he never intended to be. 
Jesus came to fulfill the will of the Father, not the will of John. What kind of Messiah are you expecting? What kind of Jesus are you looking for? You know, there is only one. And it pains me to think that there are those of us who do indeed come to find Jesus, but then we reject him because he isn't the one that we hoped him to be. He didn't look the way I thought he would. He didn't, he didn't, he asked me to surrender things that I didn't want to surrender. He didn't have the same worldview that I had. And we choose to walk away from him. That's why he's so wise here, because the human heart is quick to distort, but the word of God is firm. The word of God is trustworthy. And surely, Jesus' response reminded John the Baptist of the text in Isaiah, the text that prophesied about John coming and about Jesus coming. Like just in in chapter 35.5 of Isaiah, it says that when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. Jesus does not say, I am the one who you expected, but he reminds John what the word of God said about the Messiah. And he asks John's disciples to simply share what they have seen, share what you have heard. Don't let your doubt pull you away from God, but cling on to Christ. Run to him. Read his word. And then Jesus goes on. (laughs) He could have stopped there, but he goes on to honor John the Baptist. After John's disciples left in verse 24, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. Now, what kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed, swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people who wear beautiful clothes and live in luxury are found in palaces. Were you expecting, were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is the man whom the scriptures refer to when they say, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Now, what an honorable thing to say about a man that just expressed doubt. (laughs) What an honorable thing to say of John. And for us. You know, we are the beneficiaries of the work of the cross. John, he prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus is the way, and now we walk in the way. And of all the men that ever lived, no one was greater than John the Baptist the Lord's messenger who prepared the way for Jesus to come, was now showing those to follow how to come to Jesus even when struggling with doubt and disappointment. So I I ask you now, does doubt hinder you? Are you struggling with insecurities or, or questions or disappointments? When we bring our doubt to Jesus that doubt becomes fuel for faith. And I can personally testify of moments that have strengthened my faith. And most of those moments were certainly the moments where I wrestled most with doubt. Times where I felt punched in the mouth. And if we do not bring our doubts and our wounds to Jesus, these doubts and despair, they will remain a prison. So church, we must train ourselves to bring our troubles to Christ daily. And how incredible is it that we have the gift of coming directly to him. We don't have to send messengers. We don't have to send disciples or priests to go and ask questions to Jesus. We don't have to hear secondhand reports. He speaks with us. His word is available at our fingertips. And we can bring our doubts and our struggles to him. And make sure you understand that he doesn't berate us. 
He doesn't humiliate us because he was berated. He was humiliated on the cross. That's why he said that John the Baptist was the greatest to have ever lived before the cross. (laughs) But now even the least of us today, the least of us in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Because when John was alive, Caiaphas and Annas were the high priests. But now we have a new high priest. We have Jesus. I want to remind us what it says in Hebrews 4. The author of Hebrews is explaining this incredible gift. And it sheds light a little bit onto what Jesus was talking about. In Hebrews 4.14, it says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his, we, we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You know, church, there, there is nothing that should keep us from God. Nothing. And if there's any doubt in you, if there's any despair in you, if there's anything in you that is keeping you from God, it has to go. Doubt that robs your desire to worship is doubt that needs to die. And doubt that keeps us from speaking to Jesus is doubt that just needs to disappear. Jesus, he understands our weaknesses. But just because he understands it doesn't mean that we we stay in our doubt. We have to bring it to him. We have to come to him. And where if we bring it to him, we're surely to find mercy. We're surely to find grace. You will not be humiliated because our Savior was humiliated for us. Now, to be honest, I don't know where you are right now. I know that Jesus does. And perhaps you came to church thinking, I don't know, is, is this where I should go to help for help or should I just keep looking for something else? And maybe you grew up knowing about Jesus and well, life has been difficult for you and you feel like life has put you in a prison. I have to say there, there is a way out and it, It rests not on circumstances changing or life magically just sorting itself out, but on trusting Jesus, on surrendering to him because he surrendered all for us. He gave his life for us. And as we come together as a church, each time we come together, we need to remind ourselves of that incredible gift that Christ gave his life for us. And so today, we're going to remind ourselves again of that sacrifice. We're going to remind ourselves through communion, through the Lord's Supper. I mean, that's why we gather. We don't gather because we have nothing else to do on Sunday mornings. We gather because we have this incredible message. We have this incredible gospel. And we have to remind ourselves constantly remind ourselves what Jesus has done for us.